Okay, so the next day I phoned Ann, um, my wife, in Clearwater, and she said, um, okay, I've cleared it with uh, COB, Miscavige. You don't have to go back there. Just come down here, and we can sort this thing out. And I said, well, what, you know, she says, you don't, it's okay, you don't have to go back there. I said, okay. And I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I just thought, what the hell? I mean, I, I, you know, she was right. It was one thing that stuck with me. What about her? <laughs> And the reason I hadn't, okay, the reason I hadn't tried to recruit her to go with me is because she's a second generation Scientologist. Her mother was on staff at Paris Org for the longest time, longer than I was ever on staff even probably. I didn't think it would be ethical for me to be recruiting her to go with me. Because another thing is, is it sort of instilled in you, and I think people just natively do that because they're natively conscientious, you always try to put it on yourself too. You know, I always got the, even though I'm, I've got righteous indignation, and I've got this firm decision that I'm going to stand for this insanity, right? At the same time, you always got this niggling thing in the back of your mind. Maybe he's right. Maybe I am the suppressive. You know what I'm saying? And they all think that, and I know that because I've compared notes with a number of people who are similarly situated. You know, it takes, you know, okay. So I, she set up to have the plane fare, the ticket set for me at LAX, so the next day I drove down to LAX, flew to Clearwater, um, and met me, and it was sort of tacitly understood that she's going to be my, what we call terminal, the person that's handling you, right? So therefore, we weren't really going to have our marriage going on, but she was the only one I trusted, and the only one I would talk to, so it would be very businesslike, because it would work out okay since she cared about me and I cared about her anyway, so... Okay. I know that probably sounds really bizarre, but that's what it was. And so they put me in an apartment at the Hacienda right above hers. The Hacienda she, is Scientology? The Hacienda, Scientology birthing out here in, in uh, the Hacienda Gardens in yeah. Clearwater. And the RTC women, there's I think three in the office, they had an apartment below. And then there was an apartment above it, and I took that apartment. Um, and the whole initial idea was I had a lot of physical stuff ailing me at the time. So it was, hey, why don't you relax? While we get arrested, you've been under a lot of stress. We can handle all your physical problems. And it will, and you can listen to some Hubbard tapes and lectures, you know, part of the day. You can do some work over in the mill, which was great with me, six hours a day in the mill. You can do some workouts to get your body back in shape, the whole thing. So I said, great. It's something we can all agree on. So I'll do that. And uh, that's what I did. Okay. And you're so you're back in Clearwater for how for how long a time? I wound up staying in Clearwater for uh, ten months. Okay. I got there on like the sixth of February. I stayed there till the twelfth of December. Um, initially, I had a number of things. I had um, calcium deposits in my neck. I couldn't even move it. I went through a whole chiropractic program and a nutrition program. To totally handled that. I had gallstones, I had polyps, I, whatever. I had a whole laundry list of things. So I just started knocking them off the list. We started handling those. And I started working out. I started working in the mill, which was further workout as far as I was concerned. What's the mill? Is that the, the mill? The, the, the carpentry mill in Clearwater. Okay. Which um, services? Down a little bit south of the Fort Harrison and over a few blocks. Okay. And it builds all the furniture for the various renovations projects for the church. Okay. And I got to work by myself, essentially. So um, I did that, and I listened to um, lectures, Hubbard lectures, for two and a half hours a day until I hit the lecture on what's called black Dianetics, which was his description at the time of reverse Dianetics. And this was, an ex this was a significant point. This was several a couple of months into the, the stay down there. And this was like in the 50s. This is early on in Scientology. Dynex in Scientology, where Hubbard is saying, look, I think we've got enough of this route from slavery taped out, taped out that there's, I see an inherent danger, and that is this. If you put this in the hands of the wrong people, people with the wrong intentions, all they got to do is reverse it to make a slave. We're, we're, we're freeing you from the slavery of the mind and the slavery of positive suggestion. This way, all they got to do is reverse it. And the whole purpose of the lecture was to talk about how we needed to have some system of ethics so that there was some standards 
you know, by which it was practiced. But listen to this, Tom. I'm listening to this lecture, and he's talking about the reverse of Dianetics is tell a person, because you're getting rid of positive suggestions through Dianetics and Scientology, and it could be laid in at times of unconsciousness, or it could be laid in through your education and training. Everybody in America and in the, in the society, to one degree or another, the theory goes, is brainwashed. And you're waking them up from this, this, this collective dream that people live in and all these influences that they're not in control of. So in reverse Dianetics, he's saying, look, you just take what we do, and if you reverse that, you, you, you create the opposite. For example, you tell a guy he's stupid and evil enough, and a lot of people after enough times will believe you and start to act stupid and evil. Other people have a higher resistance and you might need to put some stress in their environment and up the, the uh, vehemence of the suggestion. You're evil and stupid, you're evil and stupid, okay? And, but if you do it enough, there's a certain pop, part of the population that will start acting evil and stupid. He says then you get to a sort of a higher, better off group of people and now you're going to have to start entering in things such as sleep deprivation, food deprivation, heavy stress, and physical duress. You got to dig. Well, all these things I'm telling you about, uh, in, you know, up at Int Base where Miscavige is pummeling on people, he's screaming into their ears what dirty dogs and what evil bastards they are the whole time he's doing it. You dig know what I mean? And it, it, it's, it's almost precisely what Hubbard describes in the tape as the only way you could sabotage this subject and why it has to be kept in ethical and good meaning hands. And that's why he called it black Dynex. I call it reverse Dynex because that has a racial overtone that I don't particularly like. It's the reverse of what the process is. You just reverse it, okay? I listened to that tape and man, I can't tell you, man, I was on fire. And so Ann came to see me because she used to come up every two or three days and ask me how it was going. We had a little 10 minute chat. I said, I'm done listening to this stuff. I've heard all I need to hear. I said, this tape describes precisely what Miscavige is engaged in. It is reverse Dianetics. Okay. At that yeah. point, I'm thermonuclear. I mean, they, I, I, I'm like a radioactive. Nobody can talk to me because they know. And it, that's the way it goes. So she just she comes back the next day and says, well, we'll, 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 well COB is going to see you, you know, when he comes here for March 13th event. That's Miscavige, yeah. Chairman of the board. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, it was like understood at that point, this guy's too radioactive for me to handle. You're gonna have to deal directly with the boss. You know what I'm saying? And so, uh, did you ever, when you were in Clearwater, did you ever see David Miscavige again? Because well, yeah, she specifically told me. My wife told me on March 13th, when he comes down for the March 13th mm -hmm. Hubbard birthday event. He's gonna see you. In other did words, it's on the agenda. Did you see him? No. But uh, I also saw him going off to watch the Phillies uh, play against the, uh, the, the uh, premiere of A-Rod for the Yankees three days in a row with my wife and his little entourage. I saw him going to the movies every night. And when, it, when, when it all was said and done and he finished his week stint down here, I said to, to Ann, I said, well, what happened to Dave? Oh, he was so busy you couldn't believe. You know, he's got the whole world in his hands. And, you know, I've heard this spiel a million times. Of course, I know she's covering for the guy. And at that point, I know he's succeeding and, you know, winning her over. Because, you know, I see he's taking her out with the girls and the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I see him trying to drive the wedge. And it's like, you know, I mean, I don't know how much more clear I could have made it to her than where I was coming from. But but I I didn't feel it was I don't I didn't feel it was right for me that I you know start actively recruiting her so mm -hmm. you know but I got it out there and then she, then she said May 9th, he's gonna come on May 9th, because they have the Dianetics event May 9th comes and goes no miscavige and he's gonna come on June 6th, because he always comes for your Clearwater and then back via Clearwater on the ship maiden anniversary event June 6th come and goes. By then, I'm buying, because I told her, I'm not listening to these tapes anymore, because I just make it, the more I listen to them, the more pissed off I get, and the more on fire I get. Because it's, it's literally, a, when you start listening to the rest of the tapes, it's literally a reverse 
direction from everything that goes on at the very top in Scientology. And I thought, I'm not listening to them anymore because it's just pissing me off beyond belief. So I started going down to the used bookstore over there by the Albertsons, by the about a mile and a half from the mill. I'd walk over there when I was done with work. I started buying books. I read about 30 books on history, philosophy, classics of literature, a lot of stuff about two of the greatest human features or qualities that I always thought Scientology was was useful in helping enhance, and that is um, forgiveness, the power of forgiveness, and unconditional love. So I just started my own study while I was getting my body healed and getting in shape, and also just leaving it out there that maybe one of these events, because there's now Auditor's Day in, in, in September, the IAS in October, okay, and I've decided to stick it out for those, no miscavige. Mm -hmm. So it's October now. You've right. been there, what, eight months? Eight months, okay. right. I'm in the best shape of my life. Um, I had Thanksgiving. Well, the only friend I had, I didn't talk to nobody. I mean nobody. She, she stopped coming in. When I made it clear we were going to have a showdown on Black Dianetics, Remember I told you I, was, I became sort of a radioactive particle? She never talked to me again. I mean, for months. And then I, I uh, raised the issue again um, in November. It was after eating dinner with her chihuahua dog. <laughs> Thanksgiving dinner, I had a nice thing. They gave me, gave me a plate. They'd leave me a plate of dinner, and I split it up with the dog, and I had a, you know, you know, you do what you got, you do what you do in the circumstances you're in. So. I had a family dinner with this chihuahua. And I said to myself, you know what, I'm not spending another holiday alone. So Thanksgiving passes, and then uh, what happens after that? All right, well, I finally at some point took up with Ann that uh, I was going to get this thing resolved. It's just, you know, I'm sitting around here. What do you, what do you want me to just rot or what? And um, the response to that was no, no response. But I did notice the next day that she and the rest of the women that she was living with in the apartment from RTC moved to the other side of the hacienda. So I decided at that point, well, it's just a matter of time. I mean, they just, they just don't want to confront this, and they can't confront it. Dave can't confront it and won't. Um, and so I started contemplating, you know, what I was going to do and where I was going to go, and I wasn't, really wasn't sure. I kind of thought I would just go uh, as far away geographically as I could. In fact, that's kind of where I gravitated to, the furthest point geographically from the main places I worked at, Clearwater and Los Angeles. I wound up at the very south of Texas, outside of Brownsville on the coast, initially. But... Uh, I remember the day, the day I chose the day was, I knew it was the last day of the football season, and all I wanted to do was watch a football game. I hadn't seen one in a couple of years, so I, uh, on a Sunday, I just put some extra change of underwear and toiletries in my carry bag that I always took down to the mill. And matter of fact, I don't think I had really even firmly decided that I was going to be the day. I knew it was going to be someday. Um, and I walked over there on a, at noon on a Sunday, and there was nobody there. Um, so I just decided to just keep walking. Walked a couple of miles, got a cab over to Tampa, and um, found a hole-in-the-wall bar and watched Tampa's last football game of the year that year and got drunk with some guy off the street. And um, hung out till 4 o'clock in the morning, ate a pizza in the park with the guy, and then got on a bus for Orlando, got a car from there, and took off. And that was the end of it. And so after 27 years, that's it for you and Scientology, on, on the staff of Scientology. That's right. What, it, what are you feeling about then? What, what, about then? Yeah. I mean, what... what I you, tell you, I, I, went, I had a whole gamut of emotion. I mean, I, was, I really wrote it. And I decided that, uh, you know, that... Part of this whole reverse Dianetics trip that Miscavige runs all the time is to get you to have this sort of false front of no emotion, which is, again, 180 degrees contradictory to what 
you know, is available in the subject because it, it, the whole subject is very, really, very simple. It's really intended to make you more you, and make you be able to freely, ex, you know, feel the the appropriate emo, emotion of the moment. One thing I decided to do I, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to try to uh, hide from my emotion, and I I experienced every emotion uh, on the scale, up and down. I I uh, sort of adopted uh, uh, a little what I called music therapy, and I get in the car and drive and drive and listen to music. So you are 48 years old. You don't have, you know, you've got no references now. Uh, you don't have a, I guess, presume you don't have a bank account or a, all the things a person living out in society would have. How do you restart your life at that age, at that point in your life, after well, this experience? Quite frankly, I didn't really have that big of a problem because I had an inheritance. I had access to, I knew ultimately I had access to almost $100,000 that my father had left me. I didn't have access to it right that moment, but I did have a credit card, so I didn't have any, I knew I'd be able to pay the expenses back. So I literally just went on a 35-day exodus um, throughout the south, southern United States, you know, all the way up the Atlantic coast through the Carolinas, across the Appalachians, down to the Gulf Coast, across, and all the way to the very tip of the country, that where I where I ended up winding winding up. Um, uh, as far as you know, the the financial mechanics of all that. I mean, so many people have so many heart wrenching and unbelievable stories, and I have so much admiration for them. I didn't really have that problem. I mean, my problem adjusting was doing something purposeful, and I and I had the resources to be able to do at least things that were for the moment purposeful. I mean, I started off volunteering at the Boys and Girls Club of Laguna Madre. I then was the players rep at the Little League. I then did uh, a whole gig in Houston um, um, for this educational entertainment outfit, which I did for about a year and a half. I mean, for the first couple of years, all I did, I got into this whole cause up in, there's all these environmental causes up in, uh, up along Galveston Bay. For the first couple of years, I adopted a family um, that was refugeed from the Katrina disaster in New Orleans, you know, got them started, got them on their feet, you know, helped raise a kid for a year. Um, my problem was getting out of doing purposeful things into doing mundane things to make a living. So um, it was really for me trying to find something purposeful. Um, but I didn't have the same, that same adjustment, economic adjustment that... Uh, that so many people do have. I mean, I've heard some stories that are just amazing in terms of, you know, the resourcefulness, you know, and I and I and I really feel for that because if I just had to go out and do that, I can't imagine what I end up doing because you know I'm doing something purposeful at least in my mind for 27 years. I can't my entire adult life. I can't suddenly just go do a nine to five or, you know, go pimp real estate or go do something that that has no purpose to it.